Um, thank you very much for having me today. Can you, is this, I hate technology. Does this stuff work? Oh, great. Um, thank you very much for having me today. Um, this is a small enough group that I'm hoping that we can uh, interact and not just have this as a, as a lecture. Um, what I want to do is uh, ask some, pose some profound questions and some, uh, and some uh, I hope, provocative questions and just kind of see where this takes us. Um, one of the things I'm, I guess the, the core question is whether we have any need for any cities at all in the future. Uh, and Wendy already just stole one of my punchlines <laughs> because otherwise how would she and I go look for beautiful people? But, um, but that's the key question. Uh, but meanwhile to start, let's talk about mental maps. We all have mental maps. This is one of my favorites. This one was drawn by the Spanish in the 1600s, and it's a map of North America. And they got a lot right. Here's Florida, here's the Great Lakes, uh, here's Mexico, here's Hudson Bay. Uh, Florida's a little outside. Somebody has described this as Carl Rove's mental map. <laughs> Can anybody see what they got spectacularly wrong? California, right. California is an island. Now, some people have referred to this as premature futurology. <laughs> but it's interesting how they came about this map. This map was in use for, 100, for over 100 years. What happened is that the Spanish had come up around Puget Sound, around where Seattle is today, and they noticed that the water went really far south, and they reported that back to Map Making Central in Spain. And then others had come around Baja, California, and noticed that the, the, uh, the Bay of California went really far north. And they reported that back to map making central in Spain. And back in Spain, of course, the map makers were good Cartesians. So they connected point A to point B, and they said, voila, California is an island. Well, I'm going to argue that we all have mental maps like these, and mental maps have consequences. In this case, what happened for over a century was that when the Spanish landed in Monterey and headed inland to look for souls to save or gold or whatever they were looking for, the first thing they did was they took the longboats off their ships and packed them on the donkeys because they had this map. And they knew that they were going to have to cross water because California was an island. Well, you read the uh, reports from the, that time and they all are talking about how friendly the Indians are. I don't think they were that friendly. I think they were laughing their ass off. You know, sure, Jack, take it east, surf's up, you know. Wait till you get to Nevada, you're not going to believe the beach. Uh, and to this day, they're still pulling these longboats out of the sands in Nevada. They're, they're still there. I mean, it's, it, this is really, well, so for the, the, uh, so for the longest time, report back to map making central in Spain, hey, there's something wrong here. California is not an island. You know? And of course, you all work for bureaucracies, right? So what do you think map making central told them? The map's not wrong. You're in the wrong place, right? Well, anyway, it finally took an edict from the king of Spain to change this map. But the point is that maps have consequences, mental maps of how, this is, our mental maps of how the world works has consequences. And that's what I want to talk about today is what our mental maps are about uh, cities and transportation and, you know, where we're headed in terms of the built environment and whether our mental maps are accurate or whether they need to be changed. Um, the world is going through the biggest change in 150 years in how the world builds cities. That is growing, is growing like Los Angeles here with multiple urban cores. Um, you'll see these purple triangles in the coming slides. That's downtown. And downtown LA is doing fine. You've seen its skyline in LA law. Uh, and it only has 3% of all the white collar jobs in the Los Angeles metropolitan area. The vast bulk of all the high paying, high end, high tech uh, white collar jobs in LA are in these red dots here that I call edge cities. And what these places are are places that uh, you're familiar, like the, the 
Other examples are the, uh, the 128 area around Boston where uh, the high-tech revolution was originated. Silicon Valley is a good example. Uh, Tyson's Corner in Virginia. <clears throat> this one, one of my favorites here, is we've named, th these places are not suburbs. They are not sub anything. They are their own herbs. The definition of an edge city is that it's got five million square feet of leasable office space and up. Now that's a ton. That's bigger than downtown Memphis. And office space is crucial because that's where white collar information age jobs are located. Those are the factories of the information age. But an office park does not a city make. So it has to have all the functions that a city has always had over the course of the 6,000 years that we've been making cities. So another part of the definition is that it has to have um, at least 600,000 square feet of retail and up. Now again, that's a ton. This is the, this is the equivalent of the uh, bazaar at Constantinople. Uh, it's, the, it's a medium-sized mall. Uh, and when you think about what's in a medium-sized mall, that's three department stores of world renown plus 80 or 100 shops. That's more than most downtowns had in their finest day. Uh, the third part of the definition is that these things don't look like conventional downtowns at all because they were built by different transportation forces. And I'll get into this in a moment. <clears throat> but what it means is that um, it, it's not about sidewalks and penthouses. Um, it's blown out to automobile scale. So the third part of the definition is if the people think it's one place, it's one place no matter how dispersed it might be. Uh, you'll soon see a slide of King of Prussia there to make my case. Um, the fourth part is that it's got more jobs than bedrooms. Um, at 9 o'clock in the morning, people are heading towards this place, not away from it. And the fifth part of the definition is that it's brand new. And you can see this um, all around the world. God, I hate technology. There we go. Um, here's the New York metropolitan area, you know, and of course this is our densest old downtown here in Midtown. Uh, but, there, and, but look at all the red dots here, all of these edge cities. There is more office space, meaning 21st century economy, in uh, the northern New Jersey area than there is in all of the Wall Street area. And there's more office space, meaning white collar jobs, in North Jersey plus Long Island plus Westchester plus Fairfield than there is in all of Midtown. So, I mean, this is now the standard form of urban place worldwide. The, uh, here's the Washington, D.C. area, and again, here's D.C. But notice how the, the downtown is actually kind of on the fringe of the action now. The downtown is mainly an entertainment location and a, and a, a ceremonial location. Uh, the vast bulk of the jobs are out here in the biotechnology corridor of, uh, of Montgomery County, Maryland or out here in Fairfax County where the internet was invented uh, <clears throat> and the downtown is kind of off to the side. Anybody recognize this from the air? This is King of Prussia. Uh, you know, which again, I mean, it, the, the, the center of these places is frequently a mall, but look at how much office space there is. It's not just a shopping area. This is its own herb. Uh, and this is not just an American phenomenon. You're seeing this worldwide. You know, here's Toronto with a vastly different uh, political situation than ours. Has powers that uh, plant, the planters have powers that that American planters weep for. Um, you can't deduct your home mortgage, so you know the tax law is different. And yet, and yet, you're getting exactly the same result here as you do in the states. Here's downtown, which is thriving. It's doing really well. Um, you know, but you've got a new palace for the arts up in here in North York and you're getting just as many edge cities. And the same thing is true here in London. You know, there's, there's the city, as it is so quaintly said, but most of the action is occurring here in the Docklands area and out past Heathrow. Oops, and you're seeing it here in Paris. Here's, you know, downtown, but La Défense is where the headquarters of most of the corporations are. And, any, and one of the big booming areas is marne la vallee Anybody know what Marne La Vallée is famous for? Euro Disney. That's right. They 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 figured out they they're, they're all of their 
and cities were growing fastest to the north and west where the rich people live. Uh, so they were trying to jumpstart this. This is a this is a uh, De Gaulle era bureaucrats version of Edge City, which is a frightening concept. But anyway, they, they were trying to figure out how to jumpstart it, and so they they visited uh, Florida, and they and they sure enough they said they said, well, I bet you this will work for us too, and son of a gun if it didn't. So, whoops, the uh, so, but this is kind of yesterday's news. I just kind of give you this as a. Um, as a little tour of the horizon of how dramatically our urban world has moved just in the last 30 years. But let me tell you how this came about. Um, all cities are always shaped by whatever the state-of-the-art transportation device is at the time. If the state-of-the-art is shoe leather and donkeys at the time of Jesus, what you get is Jerusalem, right? Because donkeys have sharp little hooves. And they can go straight up those hills. Boop, 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 you know. Flash forward 1,600 years after the time of Jesus, and the freight, of te freight technology of choice is no longer donkeys. It's uh, horse-drawn wagons, freight wagons. And at that point, Jerusalem has a problem because you cannot pull a fully laden horse-drawn freight wagon up those hills. So there is a technical term in uh, planning uh, jargon as to what happens to Jerusalem at that stage. It's screwed. <laughs> and you end up with an entirely new kind of city, uh, places like Boston here or Antwerp. And this is what happens when the state of the art is ocean-going sail or, or wagons. Uh, and again, in this example, by the way, you know, here again is the, oops, here again is the downtown, the Purple Triangle, which is doing just great. But here's the 128 area where high tech was invented and, you know, it's growing uh, far past the old downtown. Okay, in the, um, in the 1800s, the state of the art becomes the railroad. And what you end up with is Chicago. Because Chicago has, uh, you know, it was a place that was shaped by intra-urban rail, the L, downtown. And also by the stockyards, which was bringing long-haul freight, the wealth from the hinterlands, into the city. Um, the, let me see if I got that slide. Then in 1915, the one millionth Model T rolls off the assembly line. And we never build another old downtown from scratch on this continent. The last one was Calgary, Alberta, Canada, 1914. That was the last from scratch downtown. From that point onward, you know, we started this, this uh, brand new path of urban change in which that started with moving our homes out past the traditional definition of city, which was suburbanization, and then we moved our shopping out to where we'd been living and working for two, for living for, for two generations, and that was the mauling of America. Then we started moving our jobs out, and that was the rise of these edge cities. Here's downtown, and even this downtown is coming back, believe it or not. You're actually getting yuppie development along the river here. They recently had a Fourth of July celebration along the river where a million people showed up and the mayor came on the television the next night and congratulated everybody because they had this big Fourth of July celebration and not a single person was shot. They, they was very, so, so Detroit's coming back. Uh, but anyway, here, here's Dearborn where Henry Ford moved his operation out as soon as he could and up here is where you find Chrysler. Um, and we, one of the things about these radical cha dramatic changes in how we build cities is we've got to work on our nomenclature Here's a, uh, an edge city called the Big Beaver Road area. This is the headquarters to Kmart. It's a really big urban agglomeration, and still we're calling it the Big Beaver Road area. We Americans are very creative people. We can do better than this, you know. We've got to come up with some new names for these places. All right, so, of course, the automobile changes everything. Then in the late 50s, we end up with the jet passenger plane. Uh, that again, completely changes how cities are shaped. As late as 1950, anybody, any baseball fans in here? Anybody follow baseball? Okay, 1955. The southwesternmost major league baseball team is? Very good, St. Louis, that's right. And there's a reason for that. That's because if you're trying to move teams around by rail, that's as far away as you can get and still hold 
uh, together a major league schedule. Anything farther than St. Louis wouldn't have worked with the technology at the time. Well, what this means is that with the rise of the jet passenger plane, there was this enormous shift. I mean, that allowed the rise of, to, of places like Dallas, Denver, Houston, Seattle, Atlanta. I mean, places that were just barely branch offices back in the old days that are now world capitals. I mean, think of how rich we would all be if our parents or grandparents had realized what the jet passenger plane was going to mean to the real estate of those places, you know, today. Well, the state of the art today is the auto, okay, and, and, this, and Chicago is a good example of this because, you know, here again is the downtown, which is doing fine, which is thriving. But look at what the center of this metropolitan area is. It's O'Hare. Uh, I'm going to, let's conduct a little experiment. I'm going to give you the, the powers of God, okay? You're going to hit Chicago with a force 10 earthquake. Everything's level, okay? The dust settles. Now, which gets built back first, downtown or the airport? Of course, it's the airport. I mean, that, and that's, you know, and this tells you why you're seeing the pattern that you're seeing here. You know, here's Schaumburg, which, I mean, the, the O'Hare area now has more office space than downtown Minneapolis or downtown Seattle. And um, let's see, the Oak Brook area, you know what famous corporation is headquartered in Oak Brook? No, that's up, Sears up in Schaumburg. Oak Brook is Mickey D. The <laughs> McDonald's is a McDonald's, Mickey D. All right, so the state of the art today is the automobile, the jet plane, and the network computer. Uh, here's the San Francisco area, of course, which, and there's downtown San Francisco, which again is thriving. But look, the vast bulk of the economy of the Bay Area is not up here. It's here in the Silicon Valley area and up here in the, the Echo in the I-680 corridor. The, um, I think you have to think of the network computer as a transportation device, just like the jet plane and the railroad and the automobile. And the argument is that it moves goods and services around and even people after a fashion. Um, you may have noticed it's now Christmas time coming up. You may have noticed that Santa Claus is alive and well and comes to your house on an almost daily basis in what? Yeah, in a big brown truck, in a UPS truck. And that's because, you know, you're increasingly, you're going through a freight revolution in which the stuff is coming to us more than us going to the stuff. And uh, corporations noticed way back in the 50s that they could actually begin to use computers instead of uh, to, to, uh, to change commuting patterns. They realized that, you know, as recently as the 1940s, they had to have all of their workers in one building downtown because face-to-face -face communication was just about the only practical form. But then they began to realize, well, now, wait a minute. Why are we spending this much money to have hotel reservations clerks downtown with enough computers and with enough long lines? You know, they can be someplace entirely else. And so they started, this started the revolution that led to the edge cities in which, in which, um, uh, corporations realized that they could take each piece of their puzzle and put it wherever they found comparative advantage. They could put the headquarters in one place and the salesmen in the second place and the research and development types in the third place and so on and so forth. And it's you know, spread out uh, all across uh, the face of the planet that led to this pattern. Well, what's happening is that the kind of opportunities that were available only to corporations as recently as 50 years ago is now becoming increasingly available to individuals. And that's because of something called Moore's Law. Anybody know, anybody ever heard of Moore's Law? It was a real liberal arts crowd. I'm not surprised. The, um, <laughs> back in, yeah, back in, back in 1959, we built the first computer chip. And in 1965, there was a guy named Gordon E. Moore, who was a lowly electrical engineer. And he'd noticed back then that the number of transistors that you could get on a piece of silicon had been doubling every few months in, those, in that ensuing six years. And he boldly predicted that these sorts of doublings would continue for another 10 years. Well, little did he know. 
Uh, Gordon Moore ended up becoming one of the three founders of Intel. Intel Inside, the computer manufacturers, and now he's a bazillionaire, you know, many times over. But his observation about these doublings is probably what's going to really uh, make his point in history, place in history, because um, in a, a, it is now the core faith of the entire global information technology uh, world. And the way it is now currently usually stated is that the amount of computer firepower that you can buy for a dollar will double every 18 months for as far as the eye can see. Now, a doubling is an amazing thing. It means that each step, each kerchunk every 18 months is as tall as all of the previous steps put together. This means that you're looking at a curve of, of change that goes up like this. We've now had 30 doublings since the first computer chip was built in 1959. That's an increase of over 500 million times in the lifetime of an awful lot of people in this room. That's an amazing, we've never seen anything like this before in human history. The closest that you could see to it in the past might have been the railroads in the 1800s. Uh, there was 14 and a half doublings of railroad miles in the United States in, 18, in the 1800s, and that changed everything. Uh, New York went from being a, uh, a collection of villages to a world capital. Uh, Chicago went from being a frontier boom town to being a grawny Goliath. San Francisco went from being four months away from the East Coast to six days. Uh, it changed families, it changed businesses, it changed economies, changed everything. And that was only 14 and a half doublings before it finally began to level off because railroads are made of physical stuff. They're made of steel and coal and land and stuff that you finally run out of, money. Whereas this information technology that I'm going to argue is changing our built environment today, I don't see where these doublings level off anytime soon. The only limits that I can see to the network computers and their increased uh, power is quantum mechanics, the way atoms and molecules physically work, uh, human ingenuity, uh, the marketplace, and our own willingness to control our uh, creations with our culture and values. And as a practical matter, I don't see any limits to the first three. So it comes down to culture and values for me, and that's convenient because that happens to be the area that I'm really interested in. I don't really care about asphalt and concrete and computers all that much. I care about culture and values, and that's what this uh, conversation is really going to be about. The, uh, you probably had an ex uh, experience Moore's Law in another way. Same, another way of saying the same thing is that the price of a computer drops in half every 18 months. I mean, who hasn't gone out to buy a whiz-bang computer for their kid for Christmas? Right? You've had this, you know? Go out, you see a, a real fire breather, it costs two grand. It's got 512 of this and 60 gigs of something else, and it's a real monster. And you pay two grand for it that Christmas. And the next Christmas, what happens? You see the same machine for maybe 1300 bucks, and you're kicking yourself. Well, that's Moore's Law in action, and by the arithmetic of Moore's Law, that means that that $2,000 computer, 10, years, 10 Christmases later, the exact same amount of firepower ends up costing $31.25, and you can get it for free with a subscription to Newsweek. <laughs> you know? And in the not-too-distant future, it'll look like this. The patents for, for this magic handkerchief computer already exist at MIT. It's, it's a screen that, and the properties of this computer, the prototypes of which already exist, is that it's a flexible plastic screen, no keyboard, because um, it, it recognizes your speech and it outputs an audio. And I can hardly wait for when this becomes a standard form of computer because it'll mean that I can finally read the Washington Post in the smallest room of the house where I get my best reading done and where it's a little awkward to bring a laptop. Um, but, the, um, but already right now there are computer magnets right now with more firepower than was owned by the entire North American Air Defense Command 
1965 when Gordon Moore first prophesized. And the thing is, I'm going to argue that, you know, this is now changing us and our built environment. And the significance of this is that, you know, when it comes to building our futures and building our cities, um, I love this aphorism about the best way to anticipate the future is to invent it yourself. And, you know, that's what this conversation, I hope, tonight is really going to be about. The, um, um, at, at, um, there has been some work done that suggests that there are 87 forms of buildings out of which we build cities, 87 classes of buildings that are being transformed by the Internet. The, um, and here's a classic example. Um, is anybody here old enough to remember what a Kresge's was? Oh, thank God. God, I hate grad students. <laughs> Tell us about the covered wagons, Professor Guerra. Uh, for those of you who are you know, too young to know about this, like Wendy, the, um, <laughs> the um, Kresge's was uh, an early discount store. It was a, called a five and dime. And it was, it's the K in Kmart. And uh, this shot was taken in Capitol Hill in Washington. And, um, of course, Kresge's is no longer with us. Why? What, you know, what ended up killing the small department store? The mall, that's not bad. But right now, what's the real, what's the real discount killer? Big, it's Walmart. You know, Walmart. And, of course, and the thing about Walmart is that it is a, is its logistics capabilities are astonishing. Uh, it's, it has got more computer firepower than France. It really does. It has more, more satellite transponders than France. It, um, it has a process that, in which if you, you know, buy a pair of sneakers and run it through the scanner at Walmart, that starts a process that within 24 hours will fire up a factory in Malaysia that'll start replacing that sneaker that you just bought. That's an astonishing feat of, of networking, and it's what, they're, it's what the competitors uh, really fear, is, is its, its ability to uh, really deal with, uh, uh, with the network computer in a, in a very dramatic way. Now, of course, the question, I'll say, so Kres, this Kresge's is gone. Do you suppose the building is still there? Okay, what do you think's in it? Of course. <laughs> right. Actually, it's it's a it's a it's a little mom and pop called bread and ch chocolate or something like that. But it's it's the same thing. It's basically a Starbucks. Now, you ask yourself. I mean, the question we're going to ask ourselves this afternoon is, you know, is is there any future for any of these buildings out of which we make cities? You know, uh, the when it comes to Starbucks, I'm not much of a cook, but. It has come to my attention that it does not require four dollars to make a cup of coffee. <laughs> so the question becomes, well then, why does anybody go to Starbucks? Why would you go to Starbucks if you didn't have to? Community, social. Yeah, that's what I think too. The case I'm going to argue today is that the future is that uh, cities are going to live and die over face-to-face -face contact. Uh, they've had, cities have had a lot of reasons to exist in the past, like being near coal fields or ne being near iron ore or so forth. A lot of these reasons, I think, are now obsolete. When I go through all of the reasons for cities to exist historically, you know, and I, and I, I, I come down to the one thing that I think is going to uh, be shaping who the winners are and who the losers are in ur urban areas worldwide in our generation, and I think it's about face-to-face -face contact. Um, the, uh, so I mean, so let's, let's test that hypothesis. Let's go through a couple of different kinds of buildings. Okay, here's a supermarket. Um, there's a, you know, an increased number of, especially in Britain, you're seeing uh, a huge amount of market share uh, being taken up by uh, companies that are willing to push the groceries to you rather than you having to go to the groceries. Got a rocky start here because this is such a big country and the logistics is, is no, not, not a non-trivial issue. But I suspect that that's going to be um, resolvable. And I think at some point, places like Safeway are going to be asked them, asking themselves why they bother to heat and light these buildings. 
because it'll be cheaper to send you your toilet paper you know, than to pay the taxes on the building and have you come and get it. Now, when that day comes, you know, when Safeway will be happy to ship you, you know, all of your groceries on demand, can you think of any reason that you ever again will ever get into your car to drive to the supermarket? Romance on aisle eight. Romance on aisle eight. <laughs> Sign the man up. <laughs> any other reason? Chance to inspect the quality. Chance to inspect the quality, yeah. Again, I would argue that this is a coming back to face-to-face -to -face contact. Not only is it romance in aisle eight, but I want to have a face-to-face -face relationship with my tomatoes. You know, uh, here's what I would go into the car to get. This is a Dean and DeLuca in Georgetown in Washington, and you know, it essentially it amounts to anything that I would find in a farmer's market is something that I would want to go out in, in a car. To, you know, it would be the experience, and it would also be meeting people like me. Okay, so this, for this, I would get into my car and drive. However, 95% of everything that you find in a supermarket is shrink-wrapped, flash-frozen, nationally advertised, uh, you know, and if they want to ship me my barbecue sauce, uh, I think that's going to be just fine by me, you know. I don't think I'm going to get that much psychic boost, you know, out of having a face-to-face -face contact with my barbecue sauce bottle, you know. Bring it on. I don't think that's going to be an issue. But there are going to be... So, I mean, what this means is there's going to be a whole hell of a lot of empty in an awful lot of these locations as these buildings end up having to be adaptively reused the way that Kresge's was turned into a Starbucks. And it's time to start thinking about how we're going to be doing this because, I mean, the big box uh, alone, some of those, what are, you, what are we going to do with all those buildings? Retirement homes, that's a good idea. <laughs> Roller skating rinks is what I thought of. Turn them into land, yeah, return them back to a forest. There's, that's true. There's, there's more trees in New England today than there were when the, when the pilgrims showed up. You know, maybe, so it'll all go back. Okay, but let's look at a couple of other forms of, of building that are being changed by the network computer. This is a prison. This is in Contra Costa, California. It's old technology, but you know, here the guy is you know, controlling an awful lot of cell blocks from his one uh, uh, board. Um, as, as, are there any devotees of Martha Stewart in the room? Uh, you know, Martha had an ankle bracelet. Do you, you know about this? The properties of this ankle bracelet, this is, again, Moore's Law at work, is that, um, the, is that you can put it on and you can have a sentence like, okay, you can go from home to work and back, but if you stop off for a beer, the end of the world occurs. Um, you know, so the question becomes, all right, well, as these ankle bracelets become more common, we've built an awful lot of prisons in this country in the last 20 years. Do you think we're going to need more prisons? Why? Hmm? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's a good question. I, I think that, you know, increasingly you're, you're going to not, there is going to be, obviously there are some people that I don't want to walk around see walking around, ankle bracelet or no. Um, but as you all know, you know, sending somebody to prison is more expensive than sending them to Penn, which is certainly saying something. <laughs> and, and uh, yeah, different kind of pen, good point. <laughs> um, so I, I wouldn't surprise me if this technology ends up, you know, changing this sort of built environment uh, where you're only going to be talking about the hardcore uh, in institutions like this. What about universities? This is Carnegie Mellon, okay? Now take a look at the situation here, you know. Objectively, this is nuts. The, you know, this is insane. These kids could end up, could just as easily, you know, with enough bandwidth and enough laptop, they could, end, they could be in the Bahamas, right? What are they doing in Pittsburgh, you know, in the winter, you know? So I ask you, is there any future to university campuses? Yes? Why? Sex? That's what else? Just sex. What? I'm sorry, say what? The Phoenix University. Yeah, Phoenix University. We've got plenty of alternatives. Phoenix University is, a, is, a, is, a, is the online university that's, that's going great guns. So does that mean that 
University campuses are dead? Interpersonal contact, yeah, see? I think so, too. Again, I think that the answer, once again, is face-to-face -face contact. I think that, I mean, it keeps on, I keep on coming back to the same thing. That, I mean, that, uh, you know, Phoenix University is doing great, but distance learning has been around since the time of Benjamin Franklin. Uh, he, he was involved in that kind of, uh, of operation uh, by mail. But I think it's always everybody's second choice. I think that, you know, you end up in a situation where, um, you know, if you have the time and you have the money, everybody's first choice is this right here, or else you wouldn't be seeing the kind of competition that you are to get into these places. Um, you know, not to say that, I mean, the distance learning, the, you know, if you, if you get, if you know, anybody, know anybody in the Army, just every colonel in the Army has got a master's degree from the University of Maryland. Why? Because they've got a distance learning operation that just doesn't quit, and they can, you know, work on their masters from Dubai or whatever the hell they, they find themselves. But, but I mean, you know, one thing I learned, you know, everything of any importance that I learned in college probably occurred at one o'clock in the morning, you know, in the dorms. And, um, you know, I think it's the, I mean, some tiny portion of the learning occurs in a classroom setting between, you know, you and the professor. It's I think, you know, a university is a place where you frequently marry, fi mar frequently find your first spouse. Uh, you know, it's a place where you end up with a network of, of, uh, of friends that last you a lifetime. Uh, I think an awful lot of what occurs at universities, again, I mean, you just cannot easily replicate um, uh, in, in a network. Okay, what about malls? This is just north of Baltimore. Are there any future to malls? Yes? Right, that's, that's now. The malls are out on, inter, on, on every ex, expressway interchange. Do we need them in the future? I mean, you know, I can, Land's End will send me all the shirts I want in a, in a big brown box. Why do, I, do we need malls for anything? Try stuff on? Where would teenagers go? Yeah, see, that's what I think. That's what I think. The, um, you know, you, you, when you start going into a mall and start looking around carefully, what you discover is people like this, who are just marveling at the, at, at the amazing complexity of the human condition, you know? Uh, um, you know, if you, go to, if you go to a mall at 10 o'clock in the morning, anybody been to a mall at 10 o'clock in the morning, what do you see? Right. Right. Every blue hair in Philadelphia, right? You know, who are out doing mall walking. I mean, it's like a Chinese village square, you know, where everybody's doing their Tai Chi, you know. Uh, if you go to King of Prussia at four in the afternoon, what do you find? Teenagers, right. It's like a Mexican village square where people are promenading in front of the opposite sex. Um, I mean, I have a friend named Jaron Lanier who invented virtual reality, and um, he's got a lot of clients in Las Vegas where they're very much into uh, experiential buildings. And, and, and this stuff gets ramped out to ordinary uh, locations pretty quickly. And he thinks that the way that you'll know that the mall has been completely changed into a place that you go to for the experience is that the first thing that's going to disappear are the escalators to be replaced by rides. The first time you take a Ferris wheel up to the third level of King of Prussia, remember Jaron, because that's how you know that that place has finally been transformed into a place that you go primarily for experiential reasons and primarily for face-to-face -face contact with other people. And oh yeah, P.S., you can also buy shirts. Be careful with those shirts when you take the water slide back down to the first level. But anyway, that's a whole other issue. Um, office buildings. Okay. With enough bandwidth and enough laptops, do we have any need for office buildings? Any reason, any reason to go to work anymore? No. no. Water cooler? That's, boy, you're, that's exactly what I think is the water cooler. Yeah, I think, it's, I, I think, again, what's that? Team development? Yeah, I think so, too. I think, I think there is that, and one of the aspects of face-to-face -face is that 
Uh, I think that humans default to the highest available bandwidth if they have a chance. And there is something about, I mean, you know, we could be doing this via, via a video hookup. And we're choosing not to. Why? I mean, I don't know whether, they're, whether we're exchanging pheromones or, or what here, but the, I mean, I have a hunch that this is, you know, it just, this is a much more satisfactory way of doing things than any available uh, technology in the foreseeable future. And I've been looking at it pretty close. The, the, excuse me? We're social primates. We're social primates. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. I think we're pretty hard. Yes? Yeah, you need to get out of the house, it's boring. Well, I agree. But now I ask you, I mean, you look, okay, I, I love architects. God, I love architects. This slide is from the American Institute of Architects. This is a prize winner. Now, I ask you, if you had the choice between working here and working next to your refrigerator at home, which would you pick? You know, well, that's what I think. I mean, I, I do think that, there, that, that offices have a real purpose, you know, for all the reasons we just established, team building, face-to-face, -face, you know, you know it's basically bonding. But the question becomes, if that's the real reason you go to the office, do you have to do that five days a week? I'm not so sure. Okay, so does that affect where you live? Right? Suppose you had to... You, suppose you could get all the face-to-face -face you needed um, two days a week. Would living in Manhattan look good to you? This is a loaded question. No, okay. Would living in Cape May look good to you? Maybe. Okay. Suppose you could get all the face-to-face -face you needed three days a month. Would the Caribbean start looking good to you? You know? I mean, I think, again, that this, and again, I mean, is this calculation about, about, you know, what the technology is offering us and what we need in terms of face-to-face -face that I think is changing all of the built environment, and which comes to the question of, so what do we need cities for? This is, this is downtown Chicago. The, um, you know, the, the economic reason originally for downtown Chicago, or at least in the last 50 years, has been futures trading. Uh, that's been the, the big driver of the economy. Uh, but it's becoming abundantly clear that, you know, you don't have to go to downtown Chicago to trade pork bellies, right? I mean, you can do it from the laptop, you know, on the back of your yacht if you want to. So the question, I think, for the future of all kinds of cities, whether they're downtowns or red cities or whatever, is if you didn't have to go there, if you had other choices because of the network computer, is there any reason you can think of why you'd ever go to downtown Chicago? It's exciting. What kind of exciting? Entertainment, the arts, people from other parts of the world. Yeah, that's what I think. Conventions. Conventions. Excuse me? You can be car free. Yeah. What kind of pleasure? Beautiful buildings, culture. Yeah. It's what? Different. Variety. It's, it's, it's a different yeah, experience. Yeah, that's what I think, too. Yeah, the sheer spectacle. Yeah, that's what I think, too. So, I mean, so I think the great art, so I think the downtown Chicago is doing fine because there are a ton of reasons that you'd go even if you didn't have to, right? But compare that, for example, to the Wall Street area of Manhattan. Okay? Similarly, you no longer have to go to the southern tip of Manhattan to trade stocks, right? So, if you didn't have to, if you don't have to go to Wall Street to trade stock, can you think of any reason why you'd go south of Tribeca if you didn't have to? Yeah, that's what I think. It's, a to it's totally isolated. I, I can't think of, I mean, maybe Battery Park, but Jesus, I don't know, man. I wouldn't, I, I, I mean, if, if, I had a, if I had, you know, three days in, if I had three days in Manhattan, I'm not sure that my high on my, the first thing I'd want to do is just go 
down to Battery Park and just kind of groove on. I mean, I'm not sure that's. I'll go to Bergdorf's with Wendy before I'll go to Battery. Hmm? I know. I'm saying. I'm saying Tribeca. I'm, what I'm saying is that well, my argument I'm making is that Tribeca is about as far south as as I would find it interesting to go. You know, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm arguing that Wall Street, the Wall Street area is doomed. I, it's on my, I, I'm arguing that you know, I've got a, a mental uh, list of places that are going to thrive and places that are going to die in this new world. And Wall Street is one of the places that I'm worried about. Um, because I don't think it's a great place for face-to-face -face contact. I don't think it's a great place to, I don't think it's going to be, I mean, Midtown, yeah, sure, fine. But I, I mean, but in the, and this goes not just, I mean, think of, for example, you know, there are now maybe half a dozen downtowns in this country that are doing so well that people are worried that all of the artists and the minorities are going to be run out of town. I'm thinking like Boston, San Francisco, New York, um, uh, D.C. to a certain extent, Portland to a certain extent. But Philadelphia? Well, I would argue that Philadelphia is, no, is not is in a, in a second class. There's, there's a second tier. The first tier is they're booming so hard that everybody's afraid it's going to become so white bread that it's not going to be funky anymore. Then there's a second tier, and that's got a place, those are places that have got great uh, neighborhoods or cores that are great for face-to-face -face contact, but they're surrounded by 80,000 crackheads. And the big question is whether these cores are going to throw enough cash to deal with all the crackheads. You know, and I'm thinking of places like Baltimore and the Inner Harbor. I'm thinking about places like New Orleans uh, before the flood. Um, and I, 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 I'm thinking of Chicago to a certain extent, but I also think I'd put Philadelphia in that category. And then there's the third category, which is you ask yourself, if you didn't have to go there, would you do it at all? And I'm thinking of places like, you know, Camden. Okay. And my argument is that if you don't have to go to Camden, you ain't gonna. And, that, and that that's, and I would put, and that's in the third tier. And I don't, cities are not forever. You know. That's a great question. What do you think? Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, the, the, the cities that are thriving are the non-denominational evangelicals with valet parking uh, in places like Orange County. And the reason those thrive, I, I mean, I don't know, I, 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 I'm, who, who am I to judge whether they get you any closer to your God than any other place? But what they are is they're great community builders. They're filled with people who just moved there three years ago and are desperately looking to connect, which, again, I think would, make, would, be, would be yet another argument for for why you join these things face to face. Yes, sir. Uh, did you think 9 11 hastened Wall Street's demise? No, not at all. Did 9 11 hasten Wall Street's demise? No. It, 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 uh, uh, getting rid of all that empty sp uh, office space tightened up the market. That's, that's the, uh, it, the Wall Street is actually doing better in, in, real est in, real, in, you know, in just cynical real estate terms than it had forever. It had something like a 30% vacancy rate, and now it's down to like. 12 or 13. Right. I mean, one, one of the things we discovered in, uh, uh, remember the Y2K scare? You know, and, and we spent got a zillion, I mean, one of the things that's interesting about that is that when 9-11 finally happened, the markets were back up in four days. What does that tell you? It tells you that nothing tremendously important was in the World Trade Center. And that's because everything had been moved to the edge cities of New Jersey back in Y2K when they fixed up their, their, their computers. Everything that was important about the trading function had been moved out to someplace else. There's just nothing, there's nothing that, that's irreplaceable, you know, nothing, there was nothing that, I mean, I don't mean to make light of a terrible tragedy, don't get me wrong. But, you know, I mean, you didn't, yes ma'am. Is 
Did everybody hear that? The uh, terrific point. The uh, the point is, you know, I mean, it, it's the big argument against telecommuting is that if you're absent, you don't get promoted, right? I mean, that that one of the reasons that you want to be in uh, that that powerful people want to be near powerful people, rich people want to be near rich people, and that physical presence uh, matters. Relationships matter. Is that a fair assumption? A fair distillation of your point? I mean, I, I think that's exactly right. I am. I mean, this is. I mean, because if, if if telecommuting is is if, is such a is such a, a a solution, well, then we're back to square one. Then we're back to the situation in which we're saying that we don't need cities at all, because you know, with enough bandwidth, in enough telecommuting, each of us can end up in our own personal mountaintop in Montana, you know, being lured down into the flatlands only to breed, right? Now, I mean, I think that's a preposterous view of human nature. Uh, I mean, the thing is, I think that there's an awful lot that you can do with it, with it, with these new technologies, but I think it's this face-to-face. I mean, I think the, the core argument here is that the more we digitize stuff, the more we're going to put an extremely high value on that which we can't digitize, and that high value is going to be on face-to-face and going to be on interpersonal, and that is why I think there is a future for urban cores. But the question becomes, one, what kind? If face-to-face is the, is the basic issue, then some places are going to live and some are going to die because some places are not particularly good places for face-to-face. And I'm making the case that Wall Street is one of them. Can you hold your thought for one quick second? Let me get to the end of the slides, and then we can, we can rock and roll, okay? All right, so um, the argument I'm making is that the future of... Um, of cities, that, I mean, the competition for Philadelphia, for example, is not New York or Boston or Washington. I'm arguing that the competition for cities is Santa Fe. The reason Santa Fe interests me is that it's, I think it's a new kind of place, which is urbane without being urban. It's a place where you have opera and you have tremendous restaurants and funky secondhand bookstores, and you can buy secondhand boots, and it's the so- sort of place that is, you know, the kind of interesting village that you used to be able to find only in places like Greenwich Village, and now you're finding it 500 miles from anything that you could remotely call a big city. And the reason is that you have the opportunity to function there you know, and get urban quality income without the urban. I'm arguing that this Santa Fe effect, that what you're looking at, that if, if, if my argument is right, if, if, the, if that the core value of, of urban is going to be face-to-face contact, then what you end up seeing is a transformation as profound as that created by the automobile and faster. I think what you're going to see is dispersion plus concentration. This is this is a, appears to be opposite, but it's not really. Um, I mean, think about what the automobile did to New York. Um, the automobile actually allowed New York to become more dense because of the aptly named station wagon. That you know, before you had to be able to be within walking distance of a train to take the train into New York, like the main line here. You know, was a prime example. Uh, But now, with the station wagon, you you could have the entire metropolitan area funneled into trains, so it allows New York to become more dense at the same time that it allows for the rise of Los Angeles and Houston and places like that. You can make similar cases for telephones. Well, I think that what you're seeing here, and, you know, the rise of these edge cities, I think that with these, with this new technology, the effect on cities is that you can end up with, you know, with people going to nice places and asking themselves a really profoundly new question. For, for centuries, if not millennia, we've been going to nice places on vacation and asking ourselves, why am I going back? Well, now we've got a really new question, which is, why am I going back? You know? and, I, and, and the case I'm proposing here is that we can now you know, locate our high-quality, uh, high-paying, urban-quality jobs in places that we find to be attractive 
And, you know, we don't necessarily have to be, you know, tied down to our desk. We can do it wherever we want. And you can see this kind of Santa Fe all around the country. Some of these um, villages, if you will, are embedded in the old downtowns. This is Adams Morgan in Washington, for example. You know, Greenwich Village is another. Some of these, I mean, some of these villages will be embedded in the old urban texture. But a whole bunch of the other ones are way out past, I mean, way out past any traditional definition of what you might consider to be a metropolitan area. This is Savannah, for example. Okay? This, I argue, is the competition. And that this is as profound a change as one that was created by the automobile or the jet plane. Um, here's Aspen, Colorado. You know, again, you know, if you don't, you know, where do you choose to live and why? Here's places that are great for face-to-face -face and are attracting people with very high, you know, high-end uh, careers. Here's, my God, Jim Thorpe. Yeah? It's happening here. Even in Jim, have you been to Jim Thorpe lately? It's becoming urbane. I mean, who'd have thunk it, you know? Uh, and the significance of all this is that some years ago, there was a name, guy named Leo Marx who wrote a book called The Machine in the Garden that I'm a great fan of. And he was arguing that what happened in, in our cities back in the, in the 1800s was that you know, we first come to this country and viewed um, the profound abundance of nature to be uh, God's great gift to us Americans. And, uh, and, and the cities were places that only a tiny number of us lived in at the time of the revolution. Comes the Industrial Revolution, and all of a sudden we end up flocking to cities because that's where the money is. But something gets ripped up in our soul. You can read it in our novels and in our poetry. You know, something, there was something bad that happened that we recorded that we didn't like about this. He's arguing that what we're doing now is that we are trying to knit our soul back together. By tr we're trying to build places in which we can live and work and play and pray and socialize and die in which you take the function of the machine, the function of the city, move it out past the traditional defini definition of city, and stick it in a garden. Now think of what a garden is. A garden is not wilderness. It's nature to which human intelligence has been applied. And I'm arguing that that is what's been going on, you know, through this. This is an Edge City slide, but I think it's really beginning to kick in now with the rise of the network computer and this suburbanization. And this, I mean, the, excuse me, the Santa fe -ization. That's a mouthful. And the significance of all this is that, you know, if this revolution in how we live and work and play in fact sweeps us through as fast as the automobile and the jet plane did, you know, the significance of this search for face-to-face -face and this search for a place that's nice and a, play, and a search for a new balance between urbanity and urban, the significance of this is that we're not just talking about all of our jobs, although we are, and we're not just talking about all of our property values, although we are, and it's not just that we're talking about all of our tax rateables, although we are, it's that in this new world, for you and for your kids and for your kids' kids for generations to come, this is the place that you're creating that you're going to call home. Thank you very much.